Hello there, my name is Adsum and this is the Consider the Ravens podcast. We believe that discipleship should happen primarily within the context of the local church, but that the principal way that has been bolstered throughout church history is through literature. Whether fiction, non-fiction, from letters to works of systematic theology, literature helps us to understand the word and to get to know the world we live in. Hello, and I am Anna, and welcome to our podcast. It's so great that you guys are listening to us, and we're really excited to chat about a very exciting person. Absolutely. Fun fact, Anna and I, despite the fact we're in the same house, we're married, we, and therefore obviously <laughs> live together, record these podcasts in two separate rooms, because it's the easiest way to do it with the equipment that we have just thought that'd be interesting to you if you think oh they sound like they're in very different rooms or whatever that is totally true we're on different microphones but yeah just thought you might find that interesting another thing you might um, find interesting oh you go for it I was gonna say it's actually because if you know Adsum in real life you'll know that his speaking voice is very much most people's shouting voice (laughs) (laughs) okay that might be a slight exaggeration but the point he's is he's actually quite loud uh he's you're able to project your voice very loudly whereas I'm a little bit more quieter and I think especially recording sometimes just like the little sign saying recording makes me go oh and I get even quieter so we found separate microphones helped a bit definitely definitely (laughs) if if you've ever heard of the stories about George Whitfield I I think I could give him a run for his money I uh (laughs) that's a very niche joke but I I hope the audience likes it. Um, So another thing you might find interesting, as I was saying, is Bovink. That is a terrible intro, but that is essentially what we're talking about today and we'll be talking about for quite some time. So if you're in for Bovink and you're in for terrible jokes, you found the right place. Like uh, Anna is terrible jokes. Yeah, Anna is (laughs) nodding at me big time. Um, Today, we're not going to do a lengthy biography of Bovink. We're going to be basically looking at Bovink the man behind the books, reform dogmatics, but not in a lot of depth. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is because if I do try and do a whole biography, I'm either going to do that badly or just too short. And secondly, I just don't think that I know enough about Bovink to give you a brilliant summary that would blow your socks off. I think instead, I would just love to introduce you to Bovink in the same way as if somebody was having somebody come and speak at their school or their university or something like that, or maybe their church, that they would introduce that person and say, this is why we're having this person speak to us. This is what we love about them. And this is why we think they're worth listening to. And Bovink is no exception. We think he's a wonderful, wonderful man. But I think, Anna, you're going to talk to us about maybe some conceptions that we could have about Bovink or about theologians in general? I, I just press mute. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I just shouted yes to no one. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I thought this would be really interesting to talk about, especially because it's not so much a biography, but more about the author. Actually, one of the things that I found has been really helpful is actually knowing a bit about the author before you read a book or while you're reading a book or to be honest even after you read a book because when you appreciate the fact that actually the book or the story that the author is trying to tell you often has so many links to their perspective to their past experiences to the goals that they're trying to get you to do it actually means that you can look at the book and going okay what has this experience this author experienced and how was this going to affect their creativity so for example um we mentioned in the last podcast that i have been i just finished reading frankenstein karen swallow pryor has written a really good book about frankenstein and in her introduction she talks about how mary shelley and a really dysfunctional family and how she had quite a few miscarriages so a lot of the themes that are placed within the book are about creation and death and about dysfunctional families and and everything like that so actually it means that often authors possibly without even knowing it can sow seeds and themes in their books that can affect the way that they write and how the characters 
Mm. And that's fiction or non-fiction? This is specifically um, non-fiction. No, no, this is specifically fiction. But we can see that even within theologians, we can all agree that actually none of our theology is perfect. And actually, I would argue that there is logic that we are all going to have sensitive spots or clouded points towards specific things that will be infected because of our culture or because of the experiences that we've had in our past or present that will affect the things that we write and what we focus on. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And and I think that's what makes I think so amazing. Anyway, sorry, I didn't actually answer your question, though, about what some of our assumptions might be about Bavink. First of all, we have both actually had a few disagreements about how to pronounce his name. So I keep on saying Bavink, you keep on saying Bovink. And it sounds like... I one of us is right, right, one of us is wrong. <laughs> um, we, I'm sure over the course of the year of the years that will yeah end up growing closer and closer to one another <laughs> or something like yeah. that but yeah first off I the the best way I think most Brits would be able to pronounce his name is Bovink um and I'm sure I'm butchering that my my mouth is geared towards German uh not Dutch and uh and Dutch is just bad German it's it's just how it is <laughs> yeah I, I think to be honest at the end of the day you should probably put you you know pronounce a name that they say in the language but for now we're just gonna treat it as a scone versus scone <laughs> argument but yes so that was the first bit of a silly assumption I actually when Adson first suggested doing above ink I actually had no idea who he was I knew he was a theologian I thought he was actually German but that's just because I have a, I don't have a very amazing scope of all the th- theologians, especially the older ones. And I just thought he was a bit like Martin Luther. So he was in Germany. Um, although I did actually read an up a bit about him. I did find out that he was the prime minister for Holland, which I think is so cool that you can be a theologian and a prime minister and I think that if we had a theologian who is a prime minister, that it would do very well for our country. (laughs) (laughs) Controversial. uh, Yeah, great. It's controversial, but I mean, if God's leading the country. Great stuff. uh, Do much better. Do you think that's actually controversial, hon? Oh, I I don't know. I mean, some people will think it is, some people won't. Who knows? Um, I'd, I, I would be interested to hear what Bovink himself thinks after having, uh, obviously mm. he's been dead a while now, but um, after having been the leader of the party and, and having been somewhat disillusioned by it from what I understand. Mm. Um, well, to be fair, though, it's quite an interesting, uh, I mean, we won't discuss it, but the whole idea of church and state is quite uh, mm. interesting and controversial. That was certainly uh, what I was thinking. Yeah, topic in itself, so... You're right. Maybe it was a very controversial statement without me realizing. Oh no, we That's might not... get banned from Spotify. Oh, no. <laughs> what other preconceived notions? When when do you reckon he lived? So I'm going to say 1800s because I just feel like most old people seem to be in the 1800s for some reason. Most old hey, people you know what? seem to be born in the 1800s. <laughs> no, Is that no. right? <laughs> No, no, that was really. There weren't people before that. (laughs) I I, do you know. I think it is at the moment. I think it's just I've managed to accidentally read a lot of 1800s without realizing it. So uh, Frankenstein is 1800s ish. I'm currently uh, listening to The Count of Monte Cristo, which is also based in the 1800s. And so I think the last month I've just been surrounded by 1800s kind of thing, and it's. Mm. I probably obviously didn't realise how much it's affected me to immediately just go, the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> but if he was in the 1800s, then that's amazing. Good news is that you're correct. Uh, hey! <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, I think more some, some more assumptions just generally for theologians, whether old or new, is I do apologise if you're a theologian and you're listening to this. But I would say generally theologians are, the assumption is that you're quite boring, um, very, very much of a 
either a I know everything and I look down upon you because you don't or uh, I uh, or complete disconnect of I know so many things that I don't know how to relate to you and actually hopefully what we're going to find as we go through buffing is that not only is it I mean there will be parts of which is complicated I've read some bits and frankly it is complicated but the point is, is that it can be accessible for a lot of people and we're here to help you and actually see that theology is something more than just for the few who have done their PhDs at Oxford and for no one else. Actually, the study of God is something that everyone should want to and should enjoy doing. And actually, we just want to be a part of that and walk you guys through it. Definitely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, yeah, you raise an interesting point about, yeah, theologians being kind of a bit disconnected, a bit like um, separate from the world. I, th- I think the reality is, as I was listening to another podcast today, um, where the, the two people that were on the podcast were talking about seminary professors and different seminary professors from across the states and how people sort of assume that they must be just, that's all they do. They're just professors, but they were actually saying, actually, no, they, they preach a lot in their churches and their local, uh, like where that, where they're placed, they, they preach across the country. They do pastoral work. They, and we think of like, even the great theologians of our own time. I, I mean, I think of Matthew Barrett as a really great example of that. He preached pretty much weekly, I think, throughout some of last year. Um, and it it was great to listen to. And, and these aren't people that are just disconnected. Most of them are where they are because they genuinely love people. Again, a great theologian of the previous generation, Don Carson, and some people are going to take issue with me saying he's from the previous generation. We are quite young. <laughs> I just have to put, put that out there. But yeah, he was inspired by, by his father who, who was a pastor and, and, and really like knows what it is to be in ministry. It's not, yeah, these, these people aren't disconnected, aren't removed for the most part. Um, and to that end, yeah. We, we talked about Bovink being the prime minister. So he was in politics at one point, um, largely because of Kuiper, who we're going to hear about next week. He was a pastor. He was a theologian. He was a professor. And yeah, he was a writer and a very, very prolific writer. He wrote all sorts of things from travel to uh, theology, to preaching, to words, it, yeah, it, uh, to ethics. His scope is just huge. Oh, really quickly. Just want to really quickly say, and this is something that we will be doing a lot on other episodes. If you hear words that you've not heard of before and things seem a little bit confusing. Theology is just a study of God. And we are all theologians or we all want to be theologians because actually knowing God and his nature and his character is what we're called to do. And actually what's really good for us in the Westminster Catechism, it says the man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And Jem Wilkin basically says, how can you worship and enjoy a God if you don't know him? So over to you, but I just want to really quickly jump in there. No, that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Two other words that we're going to use quite a lot during this episode, but we will go into greater detail on in the next Boving episode are reformed and dogmatics because they're the name of the books that we're going to be going through. I'm not going to cover that in detail today. All you need to know at this point is that reformed dogmatics is Boving's understanding of theology from a particular point of view. That, that is it. And it's really important to point out really quickly that if you ever read the Asterix and Obelix book, this will also be coming up a lot because the little dog was called Dogmatics. And it <laughs> makes me happy every single time I read this. <laughs> every single time you read Asterix or Reform Dogmatics? To be honest, both now. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. 
Um, so another interesting thing about reformed dogmatics is that it is in four volumes. Now that doesn't sound very interesting, but especially today when we might think of things being in volumes as being kind of a box set. Maybe we think of the Chronicles of Narnia and we think of buying that as a whole box set, or maybe we think about buying it as a whole book. We are going to be going through book one, Prologomena, which essentially just means introduction. And a lot of people I have heard talking about just skipping Prologomena completely. They think it's kind of a preamble that's fine we kind of know this stuff we agree with this stuff we're moving on to the heavier stuff in books two three and four but the first reason i would give you to stick with this and stick with us is because these books didn't originally come out as one they are in four volumes because originally they were they were released on separate years namely in 1995 nine uh, sorry 1895, sorry, 1897, 1898, and 1901. So there's like two years between the first book and the second book. So there were two years where this is all that people are reading. And so that should at least give us the, the kind of understanding, nuanced understanding that maybe these are things that people were interested in for, especially this first book, for its own right, within its own right. And so I just wanted to say that quickly before anyone says, oh, it's fine. This is just an introduction. Skip it. It's not an introduction like you would get at the beginning of a book mm. that a lot of people do skip. This is a real introduction of his, why are we doing this? What am I speaking against? Who am I speaking against? Why am I doing it? All of those things. And with that against language that I'm talking about, I'm not saying that in terms of conflict. In fact, Bovink is somebody who is just incredibly, incredibly well-liked across the board, it seems, which is unreal. So another thing that we want to kind of commend to you is that the way he talks about others, uh, others' theology is incredibly respectful. And actually, he argues for it very well. There have been multiple times while reading the first chapter of Prolegomena, of Reformed Dogmatics with Anna, where you have turned around and you've gone, wait, is he arguing for this? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Rule one, wait until the end of the section. Then he'll give you his full argument and conclusion in full. Because he's so good at arguing somebody else's point that it sometimes sounds like it's quite convincing because he's doing it as well as he can do. He's not pulling up straw men. He's not making it as easy as possible to take down. He makes other people's points as hard to take down as possible and then dismantles them, but not badly, well and respectfully. Mm. You guys will hear a lot about this more in our later episodes where we go through it more when I was first reading it and I was like, First of all, I have no idea what he's writing. And second of all, I have no idea what his opinion is because you know, I'm reading it and I'm like, wait, is he just explaining this really well or does he actually agree with it? Which is quite funny. But actually, something that's something that you said that's really interesting because I think often in today's culture and with today's arguments, often we have... When people have disagreements, what they'll normally say is, like you said, straw man arguments. So making an argument for the opposite side that can actually very easily be disagreed with and shown that it's wrong. And actually, I think especially as Christians, we need to show respect for other people, whether it's other Christians or anyone else that we are disagreeing with and mm. actually try and understand, listen to them, understand where they're coming from and actually give them a better answer from the bible mm. or from the scripture I, yeah i just think that's really important and that's something that he shows really well and that's something that i think as christians we should show really well as well mm. yeah what one thing that you'll hear me say a lot if you read any of my writing or um, listen to this podcast a lot is that theology should lead us to doxology our our reading of theology and our understanding of the bible should lead us to worship doxology is essentially living lives of worship you may have heard me say this before and this is one way we can do that 
by disagreeing well, by treating our enemies with respect, with treating them with love, we are living lives doxologically. We are living lives of worship. And that is a good thing to do. And actually, it to be fair, I could just be saying this. I could be just saying Bovink was was really great at disagreeing with people, but it not track. <laughs> like there are plenty of people who think they are very good at disagreeing with people respectfully, who are just hated by the opposition. It's and and fair enough, like rightfully so. But I, I all of the quotes that I'm going to be pulling from this are from James Eglinton's uh, biography, and it's excellent. But these are two uh, responses that Bovent got back, having sent some of his lectures to some friends, friends who disagreed with him hugely. The first one said, receive my hearty thanks for, your, for sending your oration, which I have read with great interest. Not with agreement, as you understand, but my dissent does not hinder me in reading from remarking that you have set out and defended your view clearly, consistently, and worthily. And another said, although my viewpoint is extremely different from yours, this does not hinder me in congratulating you for the manner in which you have defended your own. That is beautiful. If we could disagree with people like that mm. on serious things, that would be amazing. I mean, imagine if you were able to explain your point on, on why you believe in about marriage in a certain way or sexuality in a certain way or uh, creation or the gifts of the spirit. Or, and I'm Are you not trying just to get us about, kicked off on? Yeah, I'm totally <laughs> trying to get us kicked off of Spotify. But like any of these things that are either in culture or within the church, really difficult subjects. Imagine if you were able to speak about those things. Well, I don't want you to just read of ink so that you can learn theology better. There is practice here that I think that we think you can learn from that would a- enable you to live as Uh, live better as a Christian, live better Mm. as a witness within the world and within the church Mm. to love people and love your God better. Yeah. Like it says in Romans 12, it says as possible, as far as it depends on you live peaceably with all. I think he shows doing that really well. Yeah. I think that's absolutely such an excellent point. Yeah. One, one final point that I'm going to make is that we have all been guilty of rushing into talking about things before we should, whether that's a political opinion, whether that's a theological opinion. Uh, Maybe we've written, maybe we've spoken. Unfortunately, some of those things are out there in the ether, especially in (laughs) the world of the internet. Tweets live forever. Oh dear. (laughs) Bovink didn't rush into this. I, I know that we especially in today's age, we can do that very simply and very easily. We talked about the fact that he wrote about or wrote reform dogmatics in the 1890s and 1990s. But he actually started that over a decade (laughs) earlier. He started writing in 1884 and stopped. He started basically collating information, learning about history settling himself on a foundation because he knew that he wanted to know more. He said, I wish that I could also get to writing, but it is not possible for me yet. I must first come to grips with the subjects I have, and that costs time and study. Above all, in these subjects, it is so difficult for me to say something, as nothing stands in isolation, but each subject is indissolubly connected to the other and the formal issues truly not the easiest control everything often i feel dispirited under this so many questions of the greatest importance remained unsolved and the distance between the ideal and my capabilities is so astonishingly great and seems to become greater still through continued study one could quickly decide to say nothing and just maintain a shy distance I'm I'm really glad that he he didn't he didn't say nothing. He, there is a reason why his name is yeah just getting around everywhere today, and maybe not on your circles. Maybe you're sitting there going, I've, "This is the first time I've ever heard of him." 
But the reality is, is a lot of people are talking about him now that his works have been translated and, and rightfully so. As I say, this, this is a pastor, a husband, a theologian, a politician, a man who was well thought of, a man who thought well of others, a man who thought well of his friends and of those he disagreed with, a man who traveled, a man who knew differences between cultures and knew the difference between his own culture and historical cultures within which Christianity has thrived. He knew old theologians and new ones, at least in his age, some of them personally, and he loved them. He goes on to say, I myself am still busy gathering the building materials for my own dogmatics and ethics. This is to say, at the moment, I summarize these in, these in lectures, largely from a historical angle, and attempt to orient myself and my students in the historical information, obviously, especially in reform dogmatics. A historical foundation must first be laid before one can think of erecting one's own building. And I think that that is a really good foundation for us to go on from. I, Adsum, am gathering my building materials for my understanding of dogmatics and ethics. And I hope that you are too. I hope that you at home are sitting there going, okay, this is something I really, I, I want to wrestle with, that I want to understand better. That through this podcast, Anna and I are attempting to summarize these huge chapters, these, these really difficult things, and understand how we can orient ourselves in the historical information, the historical now meaning, including Bovik, although at the time he obviously meant things that were older than that. And that once we've laid this historical foundation, we can build up. We want to be slow to build. We want to be slow mm. to understand, not quick. We can get ourselves in all sorts of trouble when we do that. And so let's be slow. If this takes us five, six years to get through the whole of reform dogmatics, so be it. That would be awesome. How great would it be to go that slowly through and, and really harness it for all it's worth? Will you join us? I think it's also really important to note of, uh, within you saying about the foundation. Actually, it says in 1 Corinthians 3 about how according to the grace of God given to me, which is Paul, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And I think that is so important that when we go through this, we're not doing this because we want to know more stuff, because we want to be cleverer than someone else who's never heard of Bovink, or because we want to I don't know, whatever it is that you might have. Actually, we're doing this because we want to set a foundation of Christ. And actually, we're, we know that the strongest stone, a strongest foundation is in God. And actually, like you said, with it taking a long time foundations, when I look, uh, went to uni, I actually lived near a building site when they were putting up loads of uh, student accommodation. And I remember at one point I was driving along the road and I could just see like really long part of the road was just nothing. And it was just, you know, the fences to the building site and there was just nothing else there as I was just driving along. And I was like, oh my goodness, God, I kind of feel like that at the moment where I'm just empty and there was nothing else going on. And actually I really felt like God was saying, I'm getting the foundations for you. Actually, this takes a long time and it's really slow, but it's essential that you get a foundation solid so that you can build upon it. And actually, just like that building, it took a really, really long time for foundation. I don't know anything about buildings, so I'm probably not doing a very good job if you guys are builders, if you're listening to this. But the point is, it takes a really long time to set a foundation, but it has to be really good. And then once it's there, the building just flies up in comparison. And actually, I think this is, our hope is that it's going to be really similar with you guys that as we go through this we're going to set a foundation on Christ learning about his doctrine and his learning about him so that actually the fruit 
that's going to come from it is going to fly up as we set our foundation on him alone. Absolutely. Amen. That is so good. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that because that was very much off the cuff. So <laughs> all of this is, babe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man well thank you so much for joining us that's that's us today i i hope that you are excited to start this with us if you do want to get to grips with the biography of bob Inc., if you think look i'm convinced that i need to get to know this guy but adam and anna did a terrible job pick <laughs> up bob Inc. by james eglinton uh he is a professor in Edinburgh, very, very, very smart guy, has translated things from Bob Inc., really knows the guy, loves the guy, but still wrote a critical biography of him. Didn't write a biography that was what we call hagiographical, like as if he's a saint and never did anything wrong. He wrote a book, uh, wrote a biography that was critical, that really looked at all of the information about Bob Inc. that he could find and wrote it really well and everything that yeah basically went into this episode came from him uh i don't know whether he's proud of that or not (laughs) (laughs) i'd also like to point out that even if you did think that we did a good job still please check him out because he will have done a much better job than we could ever possibly do so yeah he's a really really good person and also if you guys are really excited then you can order the book reform dogmatics or you can get it on kindle i'm assuming i just yes so that there are <laughs> three ways i'd recommend either buy it on ebook we, we're not doing the four in one version we are looking through specifically book one prologomena you can get it on kindle or any other ebook platform i assume you can buy a physical copy i'm sure you can pick them up second hand if if it's too expensive but bear in mind we will be going through this for at least a year so if 20 25 pounds is beyond the budget or 20 well 35 dollars or whatever it's beyond the budget that you would usually spend on a book this is a one a big book and two you'll be in it for a long time so take that into account um or thirdly you can buy on logos now this is what i would recommend (laughs) logos is the greatest the greatest invention since sliced logos Jeez. i oh. <laughs> <laughs> i i absolutely love logos logos is a bible software that uh, yeah essentially makes it makes us uh, uh, uh logos uh, i'm literally getting flustered right now i just had to re-record a section because <laughs> i'm getting flustered by logos <laughs> essentially logos is a bible software you can buy loads of books on it and it collates all of that when it references the bible you can click on it right in app it will take you to that place in the bible helps you with the translation helps you with understanding helps you collate your commentaries helps you with bible study helps you with reading plans anna is rolling her eyes as we sit here because i love love us so much <laughs> my great loves are yeah god logos my wife no <laughs> in <laughs> no. <the> order <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. I, uh, I, I love Logos. And so that is what I would recommend you buy it on. So funny. Honestly, you're going to learn a lot from Adsum. Me, about absolutely. How much he loves Great. It. No. Fantastic. That, that's all we need to know. No, don't finish it. Don't finish it. We, you are going to learn a lot that Adsum absolutely loves Logos. So of course he's going to recommend it it's so funny he talks about it on a daily basis you guys i'm not even joking so good right (laughs) okay grace and peace we will see see you next week Bye. Bye bye